for a very short period of my life. I want to say it was around the time I was the age of 15 or 16. I lived in a fairly small house in Vermont. My family didn't live there long. It was located in the forest and far from almost everything, making any task that required leaving the house pretty inconvenient. However, there's one experience I had at that house in the time I lived there that I'll likely never forget. It happened in January. I only remember that because I can recall New Year's Day being just a few days earlier. My cousin Jason and I were both still on school break at the time and had planned to spend the night at my place. This was something we would often do. We would typically stay up till 2 or 3 a.m. playing Xbox, watching movies, or something along those lines. This would all happen in the living room. This night, we had been watching a movie. I don't remember what movie it was, but that's not important. What I do remember is being maybe halfway through the movie when Jason kept looking out the window, just slightly to the right of where we were sitting. It got to the point where, like every minute, I could see his head move out of the corner of my eye. Now, I should mention, on that night, there was a fairly bad snowstorm happening. At first, I just thought he had been watching the snowfall, until I realized just how long he had been staring out the window for. I asked him what he was looking at. He kept staring and responded saying how he thought he saw something. This instantly filled me with anxiety. I think this was mostly due to where we lived. Wild animals weren't all that common, and like I mentioned earlier, we didn't really live near anything. So, someone on our property, especially at this hour and during a snowstorm, would 100% be cause for concern. Nothing happened for a couple minutes. I kept asking follow-up questions, but he just told me to be quiet, like as if to be able to focus. That's when we saw it. The clear shadow of a person sprinting from one tree to the next. Both of us physically jumped in reaction. There was no sound, but the sheer sight alone was enough to startle us. Now, this was a good 200 feet out from the house, so we couldn't exactly tell if the person was coming closer or not. We both looked at each other and right back out the window, I guess as a way to confirm what we just saw. A couple minutes of this went by, when it happened again, but this time much further to the left of where the first sighting had occurred. Slowly over time, the sightings would become more frequent. It was clear by this point that there was more than just one person. Eventually, one of the figures got out from behind a tree, but this time, instead of moving behind another one, it just stood there. And after a couple seconds, the figure started sprinting in our direction. This was enough to break us out of our sort of trance of disbelief we were in and run. I ran straight upstairs to wake up my dad, but by the time he got up and followed me downstairs, there was no one visible outside. Jason and I both explained to him what we had seen. Typically, I don't think my dad would have believed us, but I guess he was able to see the genuine panic in our eyes. We all went around the house, verifying all the doors and windows were locked. My dad then went outside armed with a weapon. He briefly walked around the house before returning inside, but he found nothing. That night, we convinced my dad to fall asleep in the living room with us. Come morning, and the snowstorm had almost completely stopped. We went outside to better assess the situation in the daylight, and we would find multiple sets of footprints in the snow next to the trees facing our living room's window. They were pretty filled in from the snowstorm, but still clearly visible and recognizable as footprints. There were even some around the house, like on top of the footprints my dad had made the night before. I even talked to my dad about it, and he said those had not been there when he went outside. Even more disturbing was how our shed had been left completely open, with the only thing stolen being our knives we used for hunting. None of this, however, would be enough to get my dad to call the cops. He always had this, we take care of our own mentality, and I guess he just never saw calling 911 as an option. We moved out of that house two weeks later. Not because of the incident, rather that just so happened to be when we had planned to move. I was extremely grateful for this. At least as far as I know, nothing happened in those two weeks. This whole experience still freaks me out to this day. Seeing firsthand multiple people on your isolated property in the middle of the night and during a snowstorm is straight out of a nightmare. And I do my best not to think about it. This all happened during the winter months of 2014. 
Around that time, my dad got a new job that required us to move. Not a small move. It was a good nine hours away from the house I grew up in. We hired a moving truck, but we still had the task of getting our car down to the new house. This time of year also happened to be around the time I was learning to drive. I guess my dad thought nine hours on the highway would be good practice for me. So the plan was me and my dad would drive the car down to the new house, while my mom and my sisters would fly. I wasn't exactly looking forward to the drive. Not because of the time, I didn't really mind that part. I was more so worried about the blizzard my phone was showing we would hit halfway into our trip. Driving in the snow as a new driver is not something I really ever wanted to experience. My dad dismissed this though, telling me it wasn't that bad and for the most part would just feel the same as normal driving. Anyway, we left at around 3pm, so we were sent to get to the new house at around midnight. Come around 8pm, and yeah, we got hit by the blizzard. It was a lot more extreme than I had imagined it would be. Although, my dad must have trusted my inexperienced driving for whatever reason, as he never once said anything about him wanting to take over the wheel. So, I kept going. Eventually, my nightmare would come true. I lost control of the car, and we were sent sliding off the road and towards a line of trees. In the moment, I tried my best to avoid them, but the car slightly grazed one of them. Luckily, I don't think my dad was that mad. It's not like we hit a tree head on at full speed. We got out to assess the damage, and by some miracle, there was nothing but a slight scratch on the back passenger side door. I held back a laugh of genuine relief. Just then, I noticed a vehicle coming up the road with some extremely bright high beams on. As it got closer, it started honking, and continued doing so until it pulled up right next to us. The guy rolled down his window. I figured he was going to ask us if we needed help. But no, he looked at us and began some awkward small talk, completely ignoring the situation we were currently in. My dad just kind of looked at the dude and told him we didn't have time to talk and asked what he needed. The guy responded with something like, Oh, uh, I just noticed you dropped something about a mile back. I think it fell into your trunk. Now, we did have a few things in our trunk that we didn't send with the moving truck, but there was no way any of it could have fallen out, or at least I thought. I looked at my dad and asked him if there was any way something could have fallen out. My dad started his response, but was interrupted by the man saying, Well, you must have, because I was right behind you. It's in my back seat here. Why don't you go ahead and get it so I can get out of here? I figured it couldn't hurt to look, just in case we actually had dropped something somehow. But right as I put my hand on the guy's backseat door handle, my dad abruptly yelled at me saying that we didn't lose anything and to get back in our car immediately. A few seconds of silence with my hand still on the door handle went by. Yelling was completely out of character for my dad, though I eventually listened to him and got back in our car. We drove off, with not another word being said by either us or the guy. I couldn't help but notice the extremely disturbing and almost angry face of the driver as we drove past him. Once we got a few miles down the road, my dad would apologize for yelling at me. I of course told him it was fine, just that I wasn't really expecting it. I will never forget what he said next. He said he felt like he had to, because while I was heading towards the guy's back door, through the window, he could just barely make out the silhouettes of two men waiting on the other side. He would further explain that by the looks of their movements as I was walking towards the door, upon opening the door, I would either be attacked, kidnapped, or worse. Hearing this was a complete shock to me, but to this day, I'm still glad my dad told me what he saw. It taught me at a young age that not everyone has the best intentions in this world. However, at the end of the day, we can't 100% confirm the guy had bad intentions. But I myself truly believe my dad's instincts were correct. The whole situation just didn't add up. Why would there have been two men waiting right at the door for me to open it? And on top of that, when we got to our new house, we were able to verify that nothing was missing from our trunk. Thinking about this whole experience still scares me, even today. This happened when I was 18. I had just finished up my first semester of college, and a couple friends I had met there planned to rent out a cabin on some lake over the weekend through Airbnb. They asked if I wanted to go, and I said yeah. I didn't really know much about the destination, 
but I decided I'd go regardless. I was done with finals, and honestly felt like I could just use some solid time away from it all. So, my two friends and I, who I'll just call Brad and Dustin, were set to leave. The cabin was about an hour away. When we arrived, we unpacked the stuff we brought for the weekend and got settled inside. The first night was honestly kind of creepy, at least for me, because the cabin was pretty remote. It was the only one on the lake, and as far as I'm concerned, it was the only one within miles of nothing but forest. I'm someone who's used to being in cities with lots of people, not quiet forests with the occasional howl of coyotes. Needless to say, it was for sure a scene I would have to get used to. But all things considered, the first night was completely fine. It was the second night where things took a turn. All throughout the second day, a blizzard took place outside. We didn't really plan for it. I guess none of us thought to check the weather before making the trip. I mean, you gotta remember, all three of us were only 18 at the time. So, not the brightest. Anyway, on the second night, Brad and I slept in our own bedrooms upstairs, while Dustin slept on a couch downstairs. I think it was around 2am when Dustin went upstairs and woke both of us up saying how the outside motion light kept turning on and off again. Brad told him it was most likely just an animal activating it, or the light simply being activated by the motion of the falling snow. But what Dustin responded with was pretty terrifying. He explained how that's what he thought too, but after looking outside, he saw what he described as something resembling the shadow of a person at around 6 foot tall. This definitely freaked us out a bit, but Brad, who was still convinced it had to be an animal, said he would go downstairs to check it out. And so that's what he did. Meanwhile, Dustin and I stayed upstairs. A good three minutes went by, when a blood-curdling scream rang out downstairs. Dustin and I ran downstairs as fast as we could. Brad was lying on the floor and pointing at the living room window. We looked out the window, but there was nothing. He practically screamed at us to go upstairs, and so the three of us did. The rooms in the cabin didn't have locks, so we resorted to barricading ourselves in one of the bedrooms. Brad quietly explained to us that when he got downstairs, he started by looking out all the kitchen windows. And when he didn't see anything, he made his way to the living room window. He pulled back the curtain and at first saw nothing. But not nothing like an empty snowy forest. He literally saw pure black darkness. Confused, he cupped his hands to his eyes and got closer to the window. But that's when he realized it was a person blocking the view. He then screamed and fell back. Now, at this point, I hadn't seen anything myself. Don't get me wrong, I was still horrified, but in the back of my mind, I still wasn't ruling out the fact that they might have just been imagining things. Just then, the power cut out. It felt like my heart had completely stopped for at least 5 seconds. I was now hysterical at this point. All doubt I had in the sightings Brad and Dustin experienced instantly vanished. I genuinely felt like my life was over in that moment. We had no weapons, and worse yet, no phone service. All we could do was sit and wait until daylight. Fortunately, nothing further would occur in that time. Once the sun was up, we took down the barricade and all started getting our stuff. We had no intentions of staying there any longer than we needed to. It was still snowing, but luckily the vehicle we brought was good in the snow. Before we left, we took a quick survey of the outside area around the cabin. There were no footprints, but this was likely because they were filled in by the snow. This had to have been the case, as there were no footprints by the fuse box outside, yet it was completely destroyed. It looked like it was smashed in multiple times by an axe. The sight of this was enough to get us to leave immediately. Later we tried contacting the Airbnb owner, but we got no response. I always thought this was weird. I mean, if your fuse box got completely destroyed, I'd imagine you'd want to talk to the people renting the cabin at the time. But no, not even a text back from the guy. I stayed friends with Brad and Dustin throughout the rest of college. We would talk about the experience from time to time, but for the most part we kept it to ourselves. We still don't know who was stalking us in the woods that night, or what their intentions were. <laughs>